Welcome to the Washington Heights Church Podcast. We're so glad you're here. Each week, we bring you the latest Sunday message filled with God's Word to help strengthen your faith and deepen your walk with Christ. Whether you're tuning in from home, your commute, or anywhere in between, we're thrilled to have you join our community. So grab a cup of coffee, find a cozy spot, and let's get started. Well, we've been in this series, we started it a couple weeks ago, talking about the last week of Jesus' life uh, before he was crucified. And, And that's why we asked those questions. You know, if you had one week to live... One week before you knew it was, it was done, what becomes more, the most important thing? What becomes the most important message that you want to share with the people that you care about, the people that you love? And so that's what we're journeying through. A couple weeks ago, we started with day one, which was Roy, Pastor Roy had titled Selection Sunday. And last week, he had titled Mean Monday. And I was trying to come up with a title for, for the Tuesday of this week, of, of Jesus' last week. And so it was Tense Tuesday. But I'll be honest, when I was trying to think of it, you know, of what to name Tuesday, Tuesday, the only thing I could think of was Taco Tuesday, because that's what Tuesdays are for, is tacos. And then I, you know, I'm trying to write my message, and all I could think about was tacos. And so I had to go to Costa Vida and get some gift cards, because I had to share my love for tacos. So who likes tacos? Okay, I don't, I I, I might poke your eye out, so heads up. Here it comes, coming in hot. Here it comes, heads up, heads up. Get some free tacos. (laughs) And if you're watching online going, well, wait a minute, what about my opportunity? Well, you should have been here. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I love you. Thank you for watching. Guess what, though? The first person to type the word tacos online, I got one ready for you. We'll mail it to you because we love you, too. So that has literally nothing to do with my message today. But who doesn't love free tacos? Am I right? Okay. Okay. That took up way too much energy. Woo. Uh, so, Tense Tuesday, that's where we're at. That's where we're at. So, what we've kind of, where we've been so far, this last week of Jesus, he's spending time with his disciples. He's spending time in the temple courts. He's teaching. He's giving messages. He's delivering specific messages to the ones that are asking the most questions, which currently happens to be the religious elite. These religious leaders, these are the people, the scribes, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the, 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 I mean, there's, there's a whole bunch of them listed. The elders, they, these are the ones that know more than anybody. They have devoted and spent the majority of their life to not only learning and knowing a lot about pretty much the whole Old Testament, but memorizing it. That's a lot to memorize. These guys knew the scriptures backwards and forwards. They knew all the laws. There was over 600 laws, and they followed them perfectly. These were the guys that everyone else was striving to be like because they had such a high, perfect way of living. Everyone wanted to be like the religious elite. And it's funny because these are the ones that Jesus challenges the most because they were getting it wrong. So if you look in uh, Mark, it says this. And they came again to Jerusalem, and as he was walking in the temple, the chief priests and the scribes and the elders came to him, and they said to him, by what authority are you doing these things, or who gave you this authority to do them? They wanted to know because they were the religious authority at the time, and now you've got this guy walking around, this lowly carpenter guy who was born in a barn, and he's talking about things that are kind of uh, going against the grain, going against the way that they were doing things, and they wanted to know by what authority he was teaching and doing things. I love Jesus. I love him so much. He, Jesus said to them, I'll ask you a question and you answer me. And I will tell you by what authority I do these things. Was the baptism of John, he's talking about John the Baptist, his cousin, who God had given a message to go before Jesus and kind of prepare the way, right? To make ready, to get the people ready to hear what Jesus was going to bring. Was the baptism of John from heaven Or from man? Meaning, was it from God or was it just on his own? Answer me. And they discussed it with one another, saying, well, if we say from heaven, he will say, then why did you not believe him? But we shall say, but shall we say from man? They were afraid of the people, for they all held that John really was a prophet. So they answered Jesus, we don't know. And Jesus said to them, then neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. He's just so good. 
Uh, and I, and I want to share, because what, what's interesting about Jesus is he doesn't just stop there. He goes, well, then I'm not telling you. Bye. <laughs> Instead, he's like, I'm not going to give you the answer to this question, but I am going to tell you a few stories. The Bible calls them parables. And there were stories that were relevant to their culture, to their time, stories that would relate to everything that they were doing. They would understand these. But every time Jesus gave a story, he gave a parable, it was for a specific reason. He had a message that he wanted to deliver, and he did it through telling stories because it was the way people could relate to it the most. And so I want to tell the next parable actually from the book of Matthew. In fact, the gospel accounts, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, all share the same thing. But Matthew includes a few details that I think are really important. So it says this. Hear another parable, Jesus says. There was a master of a house who planted a vineyard and put a fence around it and dug a wine press in it and built a tower and leased it to tenants. And then he went into another country. When the season for fruit drew near, he sent his servants to the tenants to get his fruit. And the tenants took his servants and beat one, killed another, and stoned another. Again, he sent other servants more than the first. And they did the same to them. Finally, he sent his son saying, they will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him and have his inheritance. And they took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. Again, keep in mind, Jesus is telling a story for a very specific reason. He has a message that he's trying to get across particularly to these religious leaders. This is, I mean, there's people gathered around, his disciples are with him, but he's gearing this message specifically to those religious elite, those who know the law, the word, God's message backward and forward. At that time, this story would have been a very common thing to hear. There was a lot of business owners and they would come in, they would buy some property, they would build a vineyard, they would set it up, build a tower, build a wine press, and they would hire tenants, they would build a business, hire people to run it, and then they would go and stay in another country because Jerusalem and Israel was was Roman occupied, right? The Romans held the territory, and so they would build this business so they could make some money, but then they would go and stay in another country because they didn't want to have to deal with all that, but they had workers that they would hire, to, to, run their, to run their business. It makes total sense. And based on negotiation and a deal, the, the workers would be paid a certain wage. They'd have to pay rent to rent the property. They'd be given a certain margin of profit based on what they could do. And so naturally, when this, this owner comes to collect, the expectation is that they'll give him his, his share, what they owe him. But instead, they kill the owner's servants and son. And so I have to ask, okay, if if knowing that Jesus is telling this parable, this story for a certain reason, why? Why kill the owner's servants and son? What's Jesus trying to get across to them? They were a threat, right? They were a threat to the tenant's way of life, to the way they'd had always done things, right? The tenants knew that if we don't have to get, if we can get rid of the servants and get rid of the owner, then we can keep all of the profit for ourselves. In fact, even like they, they have a thing back then called, it was oral law. It wasn't written down, but it was just one of those laws that the religious elite had kind of put into place that they followed by that said, if you can occupy a, a, an area, a piece of property for three years without the owner making any type of attempt to claim it, then it would be considered yours. So by killing off the servants and the owner's son, they're staking their territory. They're claiming this to be theirs. They wanted nothing to do with the owner. But it was also because these servants coming in and wanting to collect the owner's fee was now going to throw off the way they'd been doing things. They've been collecting money. They've been working and making a living. And now we have to deal with the servant. Well, wait, this is kind of going, going against the way we've always done it. We don't do it that way because this is how we've been doing it. For example, you walk into this room and someone is sitting in your chair. <laughs> you laugh because you know it's true. Wait a minute. I always sit there. They should have known better. That's my seat. And so you walk up and you put your stuff in the row in front of them and you sit down and you give them the look. (laughs) Heaven forbid you say, hey, I'm so glad you're here. Welcome to church. Are you new? We're glad to see you. By the way, that's my seat. (laughs) Just kidding. (laughs) 
We, we become accustomed to doing things a certain way. We don't like change. We're creatures of habit. And when we get into a groove and we find our rhythm and the way we like to do things, when something comes along and threatens that, we tend to retaliate. We get stuck in a way of doing things for so long that we forget we're doing it wrong. See, for the, in this parable, the tenants became more about honoring themselves than honoring the owner. And just in case it hasn't broken clear yet, the owner represents God. The tenant, or the servants, the servants that the owner has sent represent some of the, the people along the way, some of the prophets, these mouthpieces for God that a lot of times when they would come and try to correct Israel or give them a word of caution, a lot of these prophets were, were martyred for speaking what God had told them to speak. And so finally, the owner sends his son thinking, surely they're going to listen to my son. And we're in the same boat as we were with the servants where they wanted to kill him too. So what was the message for the religious leaders at the time? These people who were the pinnacle of, of being a successful religious person, the person that everyone looked up to, if I could just be like that, then I would be good with God. These people were considered the highest, the perfect. I want to be like that. You've lost your way. You've gotten it wrong. You've missed the point. The point of all these laws that God had given them was not for them to live a perfect life, it was twofold. It was to provide structure and it was to provide a means of building a relationship. When you consider the 10 commandments, the first four commandments are all about how to have a relationship with God. The remaining six were about how to have a relationship with other people. But we had made this, they had made this system of, of if I can keep these perfectly, then I'm, then I'm a perfect person. Then God loves me more. And Jesus comes along and says, you, you, you've missed it. You've, you've gotten it completely wrong. I was reading in Isaiah, and in, in Isaiah chapter 1, Isaiah was one of those prophets that was martyred, that was killed for speaking the message that God had given him. And in Isaiah chapter 1, he, God is speaking on, uh, through Isaiah and he says, I actually detest your sacrifices. These things that these people had to do, they had to bring and present before God so they could be made right with God. It had become such a practice that their hearts were in the wrong place, but they were just doing it because they were just going through the motions. You ever show up to Sunday just going through the motions? It's okay. I've done the same thing. We're all guilty of it. We go through the motions because we think we're pleasing God somehow with our actions. And God says, no, 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 I actually detest your actions. I want your heart. He says in Isaiah chapter 1, your hearts are sick, but I want to make them right. I want to make you as white as snow. That's what I want to do with you. But I need you to know me for me. I need you to build a relationship with me. The law was a guide for the relationship. The other message of this parable is God's patient, untiring grace. Okay, the owner of this story, he sends his servants to go and collect. And what do they do? They kill him. They beat one, stone another one, and they killed one. Now, if I were the owner of this operation, of this business, and realizing that my employees were just taken out by the people renting my company, I'd come in guns blazing. But what does the owner do? He sends even more servants. And the exact same thing happens. And at, the, at that point, I'd be like, okay, shut the operation down. You guys are going to jail. But what does the owner do? Knowing probably full well what's going to happen. He sends his son. And the same thing happens to his son. This repetition of offering and extending grace speaks to God's patience in our lives. Because how many times are we going to retaliate or say something snarky or respond in an improper way or try to, try to keep something for ourselves, try to walk into church and claim our chair because it's our chair? 
But God's patient with us. His grace is untiring. And he gives us opportunity after opportunity. But the parable doesn't end there. And this is where it gets good. It starts to get a little spicy and tense why, hence why I called it uh, Tense Tuesday. It goes on to say this. Jesus is talking. He says, when therefore the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? Asking this of the religious leaders. They, the religious elite, said to him, he will put out those wretches. He will put those wretches to a miserable death and let out the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the fruits in their seasons. Kind of like, yeah, this is what ought to be done. Kill those men. Now, the Bible doesn't say it. Because if, when you read it, you kind of read it all the way through. But I got to wonder if there was a bit of an awkward silence there. Because Jesus is talking to the religious elite and they kind of answered their own questions. So I wonder if he kind of, you know, he gave them the look like, like, you, you realize it's you, right? Like, have you ever been talking with somebody and they're maybe describing somebody that just irritates them to death? And, and you're like, you're describing yourself and you kind of give them the like, like, you, you know you're talking about, okay, but that's you. The Bible, doesn't, the Bible doesn't say that, but I gotta wonder, like knowing Jesus, knowing his personality, I personally think Jesus was a funny guy. I think he had a sense of humor that didn't convey, and I think doing stuff like the awkward silence and giving the look, I, it just would have been hysterical to watch. It would have been comical, but he's trying to get such an important message across. But then he changes directions, a direction that I didn't anticipate when I read through this. He says this, Jesus said to them, have you never read in the scriptures? Now pause. <laughs> Again, the religious elite, the people who knew this thing backwards and forwards had most of it memorized. To say something like, have you never read? Is kind of like, come on guys, you, you've read this, right? Punching at him, poking at him, like knowing that it's going to be something that irritates them because they prided themselves on how much they knew about God. And again, what's the message he's trying to convey to them? They knew a lot, but they've lost their way. Have you never read? Like, don't you realize this is part of the Bible? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. You've never read that? Because I've read that. Weird. Like, If you don't know what a cornerstone is, it was the, the beginning piece, the beginning brick, the block that would start a building. It was what they would lay first because it was a perfectly cut stone that had perfect lines and the rest of the building would be based on where this stone was laid. And so the rest of the structure of the building was based on the shape of the cornerstone. And if your cornerstone was perfect, then nine times out of 10, your building would be in really good shape. It would be strong and it wouldn't fall. And he's quoting a passage from Psalm 118. It says, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The stone that the builders rejected was a stone that was no good. The builders would come in and say, no, no, that stone's no good. No, 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 that stone's no good. That's the one right there. And what, what Jesus is saying is the one that they rejected the one they wanted nothing to do with, is actually the perfect one. And isn't that how God works? You, you read through this, this Bible and it's story after story of people that are absolute screw-ups. And yet they're the ones used to, to deliver the most impactful, meaningful messages. You look at a guy who the most popular guy in the Old Testament was probably Moses. Moses. Who, who helped deliver the Israelites who had been in slavery for over 400 years, helped bring them to freedom. And Moses was a guy that denied God like seven times. He's like, I, I don't want to be the guy to do that. And God says, that's why I want to use you because you're kind of a, mm, but I'm going to do great things with you. I mean, you see that time and time again throughout the Bible. You look at his own disciples Half of them were fishermen. A couple of them were tax collectors. Despised people. These fishermen were kind of the bottom of the totem pole when it came to the religious structure. 
They were the nobodies that dropped out of religious school and became fishermen. And yet these are the guys, Peter, the guy who has more foot and mouth moments than he can count. Jesus tells him, hey, the the future of of the message that I'm bringing, the church, it's going to be built on you. You're going to start it. It doesn't make sense. What we would normally cast aside, Jesus says, no, 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 that's gold. That's what I'm going to use. The stone that the builders rejected has become the most important part, the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and because it was the Lord's doing, it's astonishing to us that that this word marvelous can be translated as astonishing, like we kind of have to rub our eyes and go, wow, how can this be? This doesn't make sense. Jesus, the Savior of the world, a guy that was put in a, in a feeding trough when he was born? What? The fact that it's astonishing emphasizes a couple of things. First, it emphasizes this, that created beings cannot understand the way the creator works. God is going to use things in your life. He's going to use the hurt, the brokenness, the things that have caused turmoil and pain. He's going to use those things for great things. And it doesn't make sense. Who does that? Our God does. Our God is going to use the things that we would cast aside to be the building blocks of perfection. And and, and we can't process that. And that's why it's astonishing and marvelous to us. God is working his purpose through it all. Now, I want to give some little, a little context to this idea of the cornerstone. My wife and I had the opportunity to go to Israel, and at, at one point on this trip, we got to go under the, the temple to the original foundation blocks of the temple built back in David's time. And we're walking through this hallway, and I, and I snapped this picture, and it's hard to understand what you're looking at because it just kind of looks like a giant wall. But this is actually part of one giant stone, It's about 10 feet high, 45 feet long, and 9 feet deep. This thing weighs about 500 tons. First off, how the heck did they get it there? How did they move this thing? But if you look, you can see how, I mean, it's perfectly flat. And this wasn't even a cornerstone block. This was just one of the foundations blocks that they put in place. The cornerstone was in another place. But the cornerstone was what set it up. These perfect lines that allowed everything else to be built on top of it so that it was built strong and could withstand. Our facility team, when they come in and they set the chairs in our auditorium, they put a laser line down here, this aisle, and down this side of the aisle. And all the rest of the chairs are spread out. The rows are built based on those two lines. But it starts there. Without those lines, it'd be a little off. This cornerstone is the foundation piece. And Jesus is saying, yeah, that's me. Then he has another another gut punch for these religious elite. He goes on to say this, therefore I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people who will produce its fruit And the one who falls on this stone will be broken into pieces. And when it falls on anyone, it will crush him. And what this means is that those who go against this cornerstone, those who go against and fight against Jesus, will find themselves broken again and again and again. And there will be a day eventually, when that day comes, when he returns, that those who have placed their faith will be called to eternity with him. And those who have not will be separated and ultimately will be crushed. And that sounds like a harsh message. But again, when we think about the ongoing patience, the untiring grace of our God, where we've given opportunity after opportunity to trust in him, to make him our cornerstone. So some questions to consider. Is Jesus the cornerstone of your life? Have you made that choice? Have you made that choice to say, you know what? 
I, I'm a hot mess and I can't do this on my own anymore. I want to start building the, the, the rest of my life based on the, the perfectness of who Jesus is as my cornerstone. And if your answer is, well, I'm, I don't know if I'm there yet, can I just ask you something? Why? What will it take for you to be there? We have a God who offers you love, grace, and mercy, and all he wants in return is your faith. And if you have, if your answer is yes, I have, I have made Jesus the cornerstone of my life, are you building the rest of your life on his perfect lines? Remember, this cornerstone, this stone that was put in place held perfect lines for the rest of the structure to be built on. Is that what your life looks like? Are you building your life on the perfection of who Jesus is? Or are you trying to white knuckle it and muscle it yourself and be the best you that you can be because that's what culture tells us to do? Be the best you. What fruits are you producing? Jesus told these religious elite, the kingdom of God is going to be taken away from you because you completely missed what it was intended for. It wasn't intended to live so perfectly that you could shame everybody around you. You've gotten it wrong. You've lost your way. And I'm going to give it to people who are going to produce the kingdom fruits. Who are going to produce the results of what Jesus was like. Paul, in, in the book of Galatians, this letter to the church of Galatia, in chapter 5, he talks about the fruits of Jesus' spirit. That when we base our life on Jesus at our, as our cornerstone, this is going to be the result. These are the, going to be the things that, that come out of our lives, and it looks like this. Love and joy and peace and patience and kindness Goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. This is the, the result, the fruit, what's grown out of placing Jesus as the cornerstone in your life. And it almost seems like a silly question to ask, but who doesn't want that? Even when we're, even when we're struggling with the things that the world would say is great, it's really these things that we're looking for. Who doesn't want to experience love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and gentleness? I, I want all that in my life. But yet I go out there and I look for it out there. In fact, when Paul's explaining to this, he says, you know, those without, they find themselves in drunkenness and orgies and anger and lust and But then he goes on and says, but these are the fruits of the Spirit. When Jesus has become the cornerstone, this is the result. And you know what he says? He says, against such things there is no law, meaning have as much of it as you want. It's up for grabs. Get your fill's worth of this. But this comes from building your life with him as the cornerstone. And here's the greatest part, right? It's not only a gift for you. It starts to affect the people around you. When you place Jesus as the center of your life, when you build your life upon the foundation of his perfectness, it starts to ooze out of you, right? And it affects the people around you. The people around you get to experience love and joy and peace and, peace and patience. And it, it comes out of you. These relationships that you have now begin to experience these incredible things when Jesus is the center. When Jesus becomes the cornerstone of our life, we will see the fruit of his spirit. Would you bow your heads with me? Jesus, we thank you for the ability to have the Bible, to have your inspired word, to learn about the things that you said the things that were most important to you. And so as we 
as we leave today, as we go out these doors and we go on to the rest of our week, may we keep our hearts firmly placed on you, the cornerstone of our life, so that the result, the fruit of our lives would be such amazing gifts that you have ready for us, like love and joy and peace and patience. Even when there's turmoil around us, even when our experiences and our day-to-day gets tough and there's things that we have to deal with that are excruciating within our hearts because of you, we can experience these amazing gifts. And if we're in that place of wondering whether or not we can trust you, God, I just pray that you would move in the mighty name of Jesus that people would find just that mustard seed of faith in your name. Thank you for being a God who is patient, who is untirely, untiringly graceful. Help us to keep our focus on you this week as the cornerstone of our life. And we say this in the name of Jesus. Amen. We hope you enjoyed today's message. If you found this sermon meaningful, Please subscribe, rate, and leave a review. Your support helps us reach more people and spread the word. Stay connected with us throughout the week by following us on social media at Washington Heights Church on Facebook and Instagram, and by visiting our website at whc.faith. For more information and additional resources, check out the podcast description below. Thank you for joining us. See you next week.